I do, we do have a guest speaker today. You can call him Jim. I call him Dad. Um, so he, um, he currently lives in Turkey, serving the Lord in Turkey. He has been there for seven years. Um, the Lord has done some incredible things through him, in him, uh, while he's been there. And uh, it's been incredible to have him there and to have, to have that be a part of, of my life as well. Um, so uh, <laughs> my dad is, honestly, I can thank him for, uh, for a lot of things. Um, for making me the man I am today. I can give a lot of credit to him. Uh, but one thing growing up that, uh, that he was always so adamant about was, was, was the Bible. And every, every opinion he had about religion and, and spirituality was always held up to the Bible. Uh, and we were constantly in, in the Word, and he was constantly turning to the Word. And he's a very good speaker, He'll use his hands very well, and, uh, and he's practiced, and he's good at it. He's a very good teacher. But more importantly than being a good teacher is that he's in the Word. And I know that when he gets an opportunity to speak, he doesn't just say whatever he wants to say. He doesn't craft a, a beautiful message because it's easy for him. I know that he always turns to the Lord, and he always asks the Lord what he wants to say through him and to us. So I'm excited. Can you guys stand up and give him a warm welcome as we welcome my dad to the stage? It's not everybody who gets an introduction like that. I feel honored and blessed. And it is amazing to watch my son develop in this church. Thank you for giving him a place to develop his gifts, to develop into the young man that he's become. And over the years that I've been attending here, watching him, there's been an amazing growth in him. Can you say amen if you've seen that in him? Yeah. He's what I want to be when I grow up. <laughs> Athletic, funny, musically talented fit. Some things you just forget about. I'm also blessed to have my wife Nilifer with me today. I'll be talking more about Nilifer coming up, but Eliana, my granddaughter, is also here and surrounded by so many friends in this church and some who have come who don't attend here. And it's just a, a blessing to be here today. There was a sweet spirit during worship today. Uh, I was thinking, go, Caleb, just take, take this time, as long as I still get 35 minutes. Um, <laughs> take as long as you want. But, you know, it, we need to be careful what we ask for because God just might give it to us, right? Today I'm going to be talking about a topic that is encouraging, uplifting, and I hope to be a little bit challenging. And now that Caleb has said it, I'm mindful of what I'm doing with my other hand. Thanks, son. <laughs> and it is a message that I've been asking the Lord since Pastor Damien agreed to let me come and speak. What do you want me to share with these folks? And it's about grace, about grace, and how amazing grace is. Boy, we, we use that word a lot, and even, it's even a common greeting in the New Testament. Grace and peace be to you, right? We hear it all the time, grace. But the song we sang today, Amazing Grace, it is amazing when you think about what grace really is. My wife, Nilifer, is Turkish. We've known each other for five years. We've been married since December. And she grew up a Muslim because she's Turkish. And if you're Turkish, you're a Muslim. Just like if you're Italian, you're Catholic, right? It's kind of one of those things. Sometimes they're sincere in their faith. Sometimes they just carry the title. And we call them cultural Muslims. She wasn't just a cultural Muslim. Nilifer was a very deep, 
Sufi Muslim, following the ways of Mevlana. And you've heard of the whirling dervishes, perhaps, but it's that group. She's made the Hajj to Mecca nine times. She wrote a book on the 99 names of Allah. So she's not just a, she wasn't just a nominal, nominal, I call myself a Muslim, but I live my life how I want. She was following the faith. And as we met and began talking about what it means to be a Christian, I didn't have to convince her that Islam was wrong. I didn't have to tell her once that the Quran was wrong or Muhammad wasn't the real prophet. Those words never came out of my mouth because that wasn't my job. My job was to tell her the truth and let her decide. Here's the Bible. Here's what Jesus says about himself. Here's what the Bible says about Jesus. And you have to decide what you believe. Because Islam and Christianity have a lot of things in common. They both believe in a creator. They both believe in a sovereign God. They both believe in the virgin birth of Jesus. They both believe in heaven and hell. But the differences are kind of significant. And the main difference, as you can imagine, would be what? The person of Jesus. That's right. Who is Jesus? Because Muslims would all say, we love Jesus. We love Jesus. Isn't that what you want to hear people say? They love Jesus? Right? And they do love him according to their understanding of him as a prophet and a good man. But that's not who he said he was. And if that's all he was, then that leaves us with another problem, and that has to do with how we get to heaven. Christians and Muslims both believe in heaven, but how do we get there? And how do we get there? People, how do we get there? By grace. There's no other way. It's not about going to church. Is going to church important? Of course it is. It's not about going to church that gets you to heaven. It's not about being a good person. Isn't being a good person important? That doesn't get you to heaven. It's grace. So I remember when I was explaining grace to her and trying to explain that it's, it's nothing that we've done. It's all what God did. It's all what Jesus did. Then we have to decide if we want to receive that grace. I finished up my seventh year in Turkey, as Caleb said, and Nilfer and I will continue to serve the Lord there. We are part of an organization called Teach Beyond that sends teachers beyond normal borders and sometimes into countries where we have to find creative ways to get in. And one creative way is to be an English teacher. So I went as an English teacher and came back and did a master's degree at Wheaton College in TESOL and Intercultural Studies. Now I actually know what I'm teaching. It's amazing how little we know about our English, isn't it? I considered myself a fairly good teacher when I went over there, but when I'm teaching English to people and then I'm sitting in the break room with Turkish men who know my grammar better than I do, I was a bit embarrassed, okay? It, it shouldn't be like that. I should know more about this English language than you do, especially since I don't speak Turkish yet. Still don't speak Turkish. You can pray for me about that, would you? Where's that gift of tongues? It doesn't usually happen like that, by the way. I just want you to know. You got to work at this thing. I bought a guitar and praying for the gift of music. Well, that's good. And practice, too. That would, that would help. Practice. Watch some YouTube videos, something. We're returning to Turkey, and we're both. Uh, Nilofer is now a, a Turkish teacher. And I'm an English teacher, and we're continuing to serve that way, building relationships. Nilofer's family is a gift that's been given to me. Because, number one, they embrace me, most of them. And second of all, they're really good people who are mostly devout Muslims. And what an opportunity, not only to show them what Jesus is, in my personal life, but to show them through our marriage what it's like. And let me tell you something. I, I won't hesitate to share with my words. I won't hesitate. But if my words and my actions don't line up, what do you think they'll pay attention to more? And this is why we need God's grace, isn't it? My message today is entitled, Living in the Power of God's Grace, and I want to share from two passages, one in the New Testament, one in the Old. This doesn't count as two sermons, by the way, so you still have to come next Sunday. 
And the point of what I want to share is God wants us to live in victory, in freedom, and in the power of his grace. This is what God wants for us. He wants us to live in victory, in freedom, and in the power of his grace. We said that we're saved by grace, right? We're saved by grace. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you'll be saved. I've got three points to my message this morning. I'm going to give them to you up front. The first point to my message is God gives grace. God gives grace. My second point God gives more grace. And the third point, it's up to us to walk in the power of God's grace. If you're a follower of Jesus and you're here this morning, you've been saved by grace. It was grace that saved my formerly Muslim wife. And she made a decision at one point, I've chosen to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believed he was a prophet and a good man up to this point. Now I believe what the Bible says and what he says about himself, that he is God, he is the Son of God, he's the Savior of my life. Grace saved her, not by being a good person. It's grace that saved me. My mom, if there's a, a lady that I would say has exemplified living out the Christian life, it's my mom. But she grew up in a Catholic home. Even as a very good person, it was grace that saved her. My dad was the opposite of that. When I grew up, he was a monster controlled by alcohol. And it was horrible to watch what he did. And, and to understand as a teenager, honestly, the hate that I felt toward him. You know that hate isn't the opposite of love, right? Right? Indifference is the opposite of love. What I felt for him was a longing to have a dad who loved me and cared about me, and it wasn't there, and that grew into hatred toward him. So my prayer went something like, God, save my dad, save him. But if he's not going to be saved, then take him now. Don't let him sit here and make our life miserable for more years to come. That's not the way to pray for people, folks, let me tell you. But when you're a hurting teenager, that's the best I had. He was 70 years old in the hospital. We thought he was going to recover. To make a long story longer, I went in there thinking, uh, having been praying leading up to that point that God was going to save him, just interceding and, and praying, God, give him one more chance. And I went to the hospital room and I said, Dad, are you ready to pray with me? And he said, you can pray for me. I don't want to pray. And my heart sank. I thought that was it. The lifeline was thrown and he let it slip through his hands. That was the last chance. That's what I was praying for and he let it go. Another man comes in. Rich comes in. Long story for how he got there, but he shows up. End of the day, he was tired. He knew my dad, so that's why he didn't want to come. But he agreed to come anyhow. And he walks in there, asks my family to step out. And he says, all right, Lyle, you're about to see Jesus. You want to see him as your judge or as your friend? I'm like, I would never have done that. And my dad says, I want to see him as my friend. Well, all right, then you're going to have to pray. And you're going to have to invite him into your life and ask for forgiveness of your sins. Are you ready to do that? My dad said, I am. Are you kidding me? That's how you do it? How to win friends and influence people. I'll tell you, that's not in there. Five days later, my dad died. He went into heaven not because of his good works. He went in because of God's grace. He didn't deserve to be there. Neither does my mom. Neither do we. If you're saved this morning, it's because of God's grace. It's God's grace and God's grace alone that saves us. I've heard grace called God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. And that's because it's not something that we've done. It's something that Jesus did. It's not something we've earned or deserved. It's something that God gives us freely. When we're saved, we're saved by grace. But the grace I want to talk about today, that I want to focus on today, isn't that grace. It isn't the grace that saves us. 
When we look at James chapter 4, that's where we're going to begin. James chapter 4. It's a wonderful but a difficult book. James is the brother of Jesus, one of the early church leaders, and he's writing to a Jewish audience that's been scattered due to persecution. They're no longer concentrated in Jerusalem or even in Israel. They're living in Africa, Rome, Greece, and many of them in Asia Minor, which today is called Turkey. That's right, Christian center where we are that's now 99.9% Muslim. James is writing to them and he tells them, brothers and sisters, count it all joy when trials come. I'm not preaching on that today, aren't you glad? Count it all joy when trials come. Don't just endure, but count it joy. He talks about being doers and not just hearers of the word. He talks about faith without works being dead. He talks about true religion. True religion is to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep one unstained from the world. Then in chapter 4, he starts to talk about worldliness and the problems that are happening in the church. I tell you what, folks. The first century church was amazing. When you think about these people who lived in the face of persecution, what they faced to follow Jesus, nothing like you or I have ever seen. Nothing like we've ever seen, because persecution hasn't come to America yet. It hasn't come yet. Opposition is here, but persecution hasn't come. These folks faced persecution. They faced death and imprisonment. And still they were having problems in the church. The enemy's always at work, isn't he? The problems these early Christians are facing, their their personal problems, their corporate problems affecting the body of Christ. And James continues with the solution, and here's where we're going to begin with verses 6 through 10. But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Draw near to God, and he'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Now, parts of that verse, you say, man, that's not too encouraging. What is this? You sinners, purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. You're not going to find that on a Hallmark greeting card, are you? But the point that he's getting at is be real before God. Don't be sitting there trying to be something you're not. I know you've got problems in the church here. Let's talk about them, and let's look at the answer, and the answer is you need more grace. He didn't say get saved. He's writing to Christians already. They were covered by God's grace, but he says God gives more grace. As you look at this passage, you're going to see several things. I always like to consider when I'm looking at a passage if it's a truth, if it's a promise, or if it's a command. Because a truth, you simply have to believe. If it's a promise, you claim the promise. If it's a command, you obey it. So what, is, what do we have here? And I want to draw your attention to verse 7 where he says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. What is that? Submit yourselves therefore to God. Is that a truth, a promise, or a command? It's a command. Something we're supposed to do. Resist the devil. What's that? Another command. What about draw near to God? Command and humble yourselves before the Lord. Here are the commands that he's giving us to do. He's telling us to do these things. This is, what you need to go, this is what you need to do, and he will flee from you. What's that? That's right. That's the promise. It's conditional, though, based on what he said before that. If you go around thinking, oh, the devil's really afraid of me because I'm blood-washed, spirit-filled, covered by the blood of the Lamb. If you go around thinking that just by default of being saved that the devil's afraid of you, folks, he's not. One of my favorite scenes in the Chronicles of Narnia movies, I've watched the movie so many times I've unfortunately forgotten what the books say about this now. But there's this one scene when this army's running across the bridge, the Calamines, I believe it was, to get back home, and they get to the bridge to escape the the Narnians that are chasing them, and they stop. And the camera uh, comes in on little Lucy standing there holding a little dagger. Here's an army with swords and mighty men, and there's a little girl holding a dagger, and they suddenly come to a screeching halt and stop. And it catches you like, why are they afraid of her? That's really funny. And then the camera moves up, and there's Aslan standing behind her. They weren't afraid of Lucy with her little dagger. They were afraid of the lion that was behind her. Satan isn't afraid of us. But when the spirit of the living God is in us, when we are 
submitted to God, when we're resisting the devil, there's a promise there. Satan's going to flee from us. This is more grace. I've had Muslim friends in Turkey ask me, why should I become a Christian? The way they say it is, why should I convert to Christianity? Because they see it as a conversion, changing religions. Why should I change my religion? Well, you and I are all thinking it's not just changing religions. It's, it's a, a relationship with the living God. But what's your answer to them? Why should I become a Christian? And the answer has to be in our lives. People around you are asking the same question, by the way. This isn't unique to Turkey. Think about your neighbors. Think about your workplace. They're watching you. They're watching your life. And they're wondering, you say you're a Christian. You talk about this. Why should I follow your way? And what pains my heart is when Christians, and by the way, this is all of us, everybody, fails to live in victory. As I said, God wants us to live in victory and freedom and in the power of his grace. And that's the challenge of sanctification. That's the challenge of our walk. The motto of this church is wonderful. Taking you from where you are to where God wants you to be. How simple is that? But isn't that the answer? God's really impressed with how long you've been a Christian, isn't he? No, he's not. What he's looking at is where are you now? What are you doing now? If you're driving out to Colorado, if you're driving out west to see the beautiful scenery, how many of you like the west? You like the the ruggedness of the mountains in the west? Some of you don't. You like Illinois. Okay, that's all right. I'm not judging you, brothers and sisters. I'm not. Colorado's amazing to me. But you have to pay a price when you live in Illinois to get to Colorado, don't you? If you're driving, what's that price you have to pay? It's called Kansas. It's called Nebraska. Some of you hear those words and your butt starts hurting because you remember, oh man, that was a long drive. Oh. And, and it seems to go on forever. They say <laughs> Nebraska is the only state where you, your dog can run away and you can watch him go for three days. All right, no. So you're driving from Illinois, you get most of the way through Kansas, and you say, I'm going to stop here. This is where I've, I've been on this journey a long time, man. I, you don't know how many hours I've been driving, and this is far enough for me. Good enough, right? Halfway through Kansas. If anybody's from Kansas, by the way, I apologize. Wonderful state. Wonder, wonderful. Actually, I was uh, going to Mardi Gras once on evangelism outreach, and our, our van broke down over one of the, the bridges over one of the swamps. I think Louisiana is a swamp, but it was a big swamp going out of, out of New Orleans, and our van broke down. We pulled off on an exit, and I'm thinking there'll be a gas station or something. There was a boat launch into the swamp and a street light. That's what was at the exit, and I'm like, what is this? And God miraculously got us back, but I promised at that point that I would never ridicule Illinois again. I'm from Wisconsin, by the way, but I would never ridicule Illinois again because there's actual ground you can stand on. If you have car problems, you can walk to get help. You know, you don't have to, you don't have to be chased by alligators when you break down in Illinois. However, I didn't promise anything about Kansas and Nebraska, but... You can't stop short of the goal. You can't say, I've come far enough and this is it. We've got to finish the race. And the way we finish the race is by staying active and by staying in tune with God and being recipients of more grace. I think about this idea of more grace. Another way we could say more grace might be simply the word favor. Do you want God's favor? Do you want God's favor? I do too. I was thinking about people in the Bible who had God's favor. And there are a few of them that came to mind. And one of them starts out in the uh, book of Genesis. And his name was Noah. And it says, Noah found grace or favor in the eyes of the Lord. Another one is Joseph. You know the story of Joseph, right? This guy has a dream. He gets unjustly sold off into slavery. 
owned by this guy named Potiphar, and he rises to the top of Potiphar's house. God gives him favor. And then he gets accused of flirting with Potiphar's wife and gets thrown into prison. He's back down, but God raises him up again, not only to the top of the prison, but second in command of all of Egypt. God's favor was on him. And I think about Daniel. It says in Daniel chapter 1 that God's favor was on Daniel. Stephen, Stephen in Acts chapter 6, do you know the story of Stephen? one of the early Christians, and it says he was full of grace and power and preaching, preaching, and people are following Jesus because of his words. And Jesus, in John chapter 1, it says he was full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. Let me tell you what happened to these guys. Noah gets stuck in a boat in a giant flood. Joseph ends up in prison. Daniel ends up in captivity his whole life. Stephen gets stoned to death. And Jesus dies on a cross. God's grace doesn't mean you're going to escape the problems. God's grace means he's going to give you strength to go through them. I was recently talking to my nephew. He's on his second marriage. His first wife died of cancer. And when she was suffering from cancer, he was out in Hawaii with her and decided to go on a hike. I've never been to Hawaii, but it's a mountainous island, islands. And he was on this long hike with these cutbacks and these hills and volcanic all this stuff going on, and he was getting tired. He was getting fatigued and tired, and he starts to complain. He said, I was complaining and saying, God, I'm tired. I can't even go on. My legs burn. I'm exhausted. I'm thirsty, and and I don't see the end in sight. Every time I think I get to the end, there's another hill up there, and he's really not complaining about the hike he's on. He's complaining about the bigger picture that he's facing in life, and he said this to me. Here's what God spoke to me. You ask me, to conform you to the image of my son. You want me to shape you and change you into the person I want you to be, and yet when I'm doing it, you're complaining about it. And my nephew said, you know, we we look for the end of the hike. We look for the end of the trial when we, we feel closest to God, right? I survived through the trial, but now I'm close to God. Now I feel his presence. And he said, I can't help but wonder if we're closer to him when we're in the middle of the trial. Good words. God gives more grace. But this more grace is not unconditional. This more grace has a condition. We like Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a hope and a future. And you might even have that on your door or your house or something. But remember, this was written to captives. Seventy years of captivity because of idolatry and sin and turning away from God that that hope was given, that that promise was given. And it was conditional on their turning back to him. He writes, Jeremiah writes in chapter 17, before he wrote that, Cursed is the man who trusts in man, but blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. God's not going to say, go ahead and live your life however you want, and my blessing's on you. Go ahead and do whatever you want, I'm going to give you more grace. He doesn't say that. Abraham Lincoln was asked during the Civil War, Mr. President, do you think that God is on our side? And he said, that's not the question. The question is whether or not we're on the Lord's side. He understood. There are Christian men on both sides. There are men reading the Bible on both sides, praying to the God, same God on both sides. Lincoln understood it wasn't God needs to be with us. Are we doing what God wants us to do? So God gives grace, and God gives more grace. My final point is putting legs on this message. It's up to us to walk in the power of his grace. And I want us to look at a story in the Old Testament, 1 Samuel chapter 14. 1 Samuel chapter 14 is a story about David's best friend. His name was Jonathan, and Jonathan is also the son of King Saul. So Jonathan is with his dad right now. He's with King Saul and the armies of Israel, ready to face up against the Philistine army. The Israelites are on one side of a ravine. The Philistines are another. And Jonathan has an idea that's never come into my mind ever in my life, and I doubt it ever will. He wakes up, he gets his armor bearer up, and he says, hey, you know what? Let's go over there and see if God could just use the two of us to defeat that whole army. 
I mean, it's one thing to rally the troops and get the whole troop behind you, right? To get the whole army with you. But he says, let's us go up there and see what God wants to do. Are you kidding me? I'm really impressed with David and his life, and he's the epitome of a godly king. Jonathan isn't too bad here himself. Here's what he says in verse 6. Jonathan said to the young man who carried his armor, Come, let's go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. And his armor bearer said to him, Do all that is in your heart. Do as you wish. Behold, I'm with you heart and soul. I want to take a look at a couple things there. First of all, he calls the Philistines these uncircumcised. Low blow, Jonathan, all right? It's a bold statement. It's a bold statement. He's he's calling out the, the fact that they're not the chosen ones, that they're not the called ones from God. And he's making that distinction. He's saying, let's go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. And then he says, it may be that the Lord will work for us. Folks, does that sound like a man who's filled with faith to you? Does that sound like Elijah saying, Thus saith the Lord, it's not going to rain again in this land until I say it will? Or does it sound like Peter and Paul saying, Rise up and walk, you're healed in Jesus' name? He's not saying that. He doesn't know the outcome of this. And he lays out a fleece at that point. If you continue reading that chapter, their fleece is this. Armor bear, let's go up to the hill and show ourselves to them. And if they say, come over here, then we're going to go because God's given them into our hands. If they say, stay there, we're coming after you, then God hasn't given them to us. Are you fleece people? I'm not good at fleeces. I I had an opportunity. uh, Well, I had a university call me recently and invite me for an interview And I was saying, well, Lord, I don't know if this is from you or not. And I got the call before I got home. So as I was walking home from giving a lesson, I said, Lord, I'd like to to ask you for a fleece right now. If uh, If I find money, yes, if I find money on the way home, 200 lira note, it's the biggest one they make. If I find a 200 lira note, then I'll know that this is from you. That's my confirmation. And I said, well, wait a minute, 200 lira, that's kind of big. You don't see many of those. 100 lira note, Lord. Uh, A 100 lira note will will do fine. If I find one of those, then I'll know, "Eh, wait a minute, now it sounds like I'm being greedy. I just want money out of this fleece thing. All right, Lord, you you, you give me the money, I'll give it away. But let me find the money, and 100 lira is still pretty uncommon. Lord, a coin, if I find even a coin, Lord, anything of value. If I find anything of value on this walk home, then I'll know that you want me to pursue this. And as I'm sitting there feeling really stupid already because I'm not good at this fleece thing, as I just said, the Lord brought to my mind that Sunday somebody was leading worship at our international church and they led this Matt Redman song and he says, never once have I left you on your own. Never once have I ever walked alone. It was, it was along those lines. The Lord's promise about I've never left you alone. You've never walked alone. I've been with you every step. And God's saying, you want something of value? What more could I give you than the promise that I'm going to be with you? I've never left you, and I'm here with you every step of the way. And as usual, my great ideas just crumble, and I'm like, I'm sorry, Lord. You know, whatever you want, I'm trusting you for this. I feel stupid for uh, the fleece. I'm not saying fleeces are bad, but mine don't seem to work real well all the time. Don't try to make them easy for the Lord either. Heads, Lord. Heads, Lord. It's from you. and t- No, it's... For nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. Jonathan understood that God doesn't need an army to defeat an army. Two men was more than enough, and that's exactly what happened. Those two men go, they kill 20 when they go up there, which is impressive by itself. And then the Philistines turn on themselves, and God says, I got the rest of this. And they go and kill themselves. This is funny stuff. I mean, this is really good if you think about that. An army doesn't turn on themselves and kill themselves. This is, this is good reading. Something that isn't stated here, but it's another point from verse 6, and that was Jonathan was looking for God's favor. He was looking for God's grace, and he wanted an opportunity to walk in that. And that's why I brought this up as an example of more grace. The Bible is replete with examples like this, but this is an example of a man that I say, I want to be like that. 
I want to walk in the power of God's grace. I want to live in that power and that victory. And I'm not going to let the fact that there are two of us against an army turn me back because I serve a God who's bigger than an army. And it's not up to me anyhow. It's up to him. Praise God for that. I have a little video clip I want to show you, and then I'm going to close with a word of prayer. God's wanting us to submit to him. The secret to living in the power of God's grace is right where we started. Submit to God. Resist the devil. Humble yourself before him. And if you do that, he'll draw near to you. The devil will flee, and God will exalt you. Jesus, I have decided to give you this. Really? Yeah. You know whoever sits here makes all the decisions, right? I know, and I'm always making decisions, but you make the perfect decisions, so you just sit right down and start making them. Wow, I'm honored. I mean, this feels great. <laughs> Kathleen, guess what? I just got my new credit card. It's time to go shopping. <laughs> oh, really? I thought your husband and you were going to pay off debt. Oh, yeah. I mean, money's kind of tight, but I figured he doesn't have to know about it. So do you want to oh. go with me? No. <laughs> no? Why? Uh, what I mean is, uh, I don't know. Um, so let me check my schedule, and then I'll get back to you. Okay, yeah, give me a call. Okay. <laughs> Kat, what's going on? What do you mean? Well, I'm kind of one cheek in it here. Look, I just want to make sure we're on the same page. You wanted me to sit here, right? Well, of course. And whoever sits here makes all the decisions? Right. So what's the problem? Uh, there's not a problem. I just, I don't know what I was thinking. Really, please, here, sit down. As long as you're sure. I'm sure. Okay. okay. So, let's start over. Okay. All right. Kat, I noticed that you've been losing your temper a lot lately. Right. So, okay, Jesus, you know what? I know what you're going to say, but um, see, you, do? you don't know the whole situation, you know? Oh. I, well, all I'm saying is that your attitude is a decision. Yes, of course, but I have a lot going on right now. <laughs> well, I know you're under a lot of pressure. Pressure? Jesus, you don't understand pressure, okay? This I, isn't working, Kat. What? We can't both sit on the seat. It's either me or it's you. Okay, I know. You know, I just, I didn't think it was going to be this hard, but here, just take it. No, I'm not going to take it. You have to give it to me. Okay, here. Kathleen, make a choice. I can't. You just did. Do you see yourself up there at all? And yet we can laugh about it because God already knows. He knows us. He knows our failures, our weaknesses. He knows you're going to fail again. You are all going to fail again. And God's grace is still there. And he won't turn you away. And he's patiently waiting. Let's make the decision to live in the power of his grace. I want to pray for all of us. I know you have prayer partners that come up, prayer people that come up. I'd invite you to come up if that's appropriate at this point. If you want somebody to pray for you, this is a praying church. I asked for prayer, by the way, a week ago for my mom's eye, and her eye is better. It was on, she was on a high dose of strong medication. The next step was surgery, and her eye is healed. So thank you. This is the power of prayer. This is the power of the God we serve, and this is more grace. Father, Thank you so much for your love for us. Thank you for saving us. Jesus, thank you for what you did on the cross. Thank you for your willingness and your desire to make the decisions in our life to help us every step of the way. Thank you for your patience when we have a hard time letting you sit on that stool. And it's a decision we have to make every day. But you desire to give us more grace. You desire to help us be victorious. You desire to help us live in freedom. And walk in the power of your grace. Here we are, Lord. Flawed people. With hearts that desire you. Draw us to you. Use us for your glory. It's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.